In 1999, Universal opened a park that would change the theme park industry forever. 25 years later, this park continues to impress millions of visitors. So let's explore the secrets behind one of the world's most iconic theme parks, Islands of Adventure. Join us as we uncover the secrets, the innovation and the incredible design that made Islands of Adventure Universal's most successful theme park. Let the adventure begin! When Universal Studios Florida opened in 1999, it was a hybrid between studios and theme park, but Universal planned to create an entire resort, Universal City Florida. This plan showcased a park to complement Universal Studios Florida, that being Cartoon World. This park would be geared toward the younger guests and families, with dynamic cartoons from Looney Tunes to Dr. Seuss and even DC Comics. Some of the park's design was done by the Goddard Group, or Landmark Entertainment, as it was known back then. In order to create such park, Universal needed to reach out to other studios that owned these properties. While much of Cartoon World focused on classic evergreen kids programming, one land stood out, a land based on heroes. Yes, Universal originally wanted a DC Comics land for the park. This included Batman and Superman. Most designs were done by the Goddard Group. Unfortunately, Warner Brothers would never partner with Universal, opting for Six Flags instead. However, the biggest change to Islands of Adventure would come from an unexpected place. When the Jurassic Park ride opened in California, it was a smash hit, as so Universal quickly planned a version for Orlando. Should it go next to Back to the Future the ride? Well, maybe no. How about in the new theme park? So the designers had to quickly come up with a new concept for this park. What if you could travel to a world of adventure, a world where dinosaurs roam the land, a world of legends and myths, a world where cartoons come to life? Islands of Adventure was born. The lands or islands would be based on literally media. DC got replaced with Marvel. Comic strips adorned Toon Lagoon, bringing classic J. Ward cartoons to life. Jurassic Park was actually a novel. The Lost Continent brought myths from different places, the Hellenic legend of Poseidon, the diverse tales of Sinbad and the magic of Merlin and dragons. Sue's landing brought the evergreen children's stories to life. Now, let's journey into the park, exploring its secrets and attention to detail. Islands of Adventure features an imposing lighthouse as its icon, featuring a cascading shape that gives a sense of intrigue to visitors. The lighthouse marks the entrance to the park, calling the visitors, this is the call of adventure. Guests enter through a main street-like area called Port of Entry. This land combines architecture from different corners of the world, but focuses more on the vernacular self-made type. One of my favorite details is the windmill. Another classic is the Island of Adventure trading post sign. There are some funnier details like the Open Arms Hotel and the Fire Department that caught fire. These spots also have fun audio cues. Sound is an important element in theme park design. It helps guests feel transported to this fictional environment. After all, hearing is one of our senses, and theme parks tend to play with these different sensory experiences. Another genius design decision was a lake. You see, the park is laid out like a loop, with a lake in the middle. This makes it easier for guests to travel around the park. The original Loop design was first utilized at Six Flags over Texas. The lake gives a glimpse into each land of the park and provides some nice reflections. It also now includes a new focal point, Velocicoaster. But an area most fans overlook is Seuss Landing. Dedicated to these classic kids' books, this land features Seussian architecture with known straight buildings that look as if they are coming straight out of the book. This was accomplished by using styrofoam for the cladding. Even the palm trees here bend and twist. Circus MacGuffus is a great example. It looks almost like porcelain, fragile, but it also looks as if it could fly away in the wind. Another detail are the blue wooden poles that in the story hold up this tent. Universal creative teams also added truffula trees, which are a Dr. Seuss classic. Green Eggs and Ham is another great spot, with a giant ham building and 
canopies that look like Susian forks. This area near the water is called Snitch Beach and it's very overlooked by gas, so it's a nice spot to take a break from the trails and observe the snitches if you want to see. More of the land details, you can hop on the high in the sky Sus trolley train ride. It also provides some kinetic energy to the park. This ride was originally going to be Sylvester McMonkey McBean's very unusual driving machines. Another great facade is the cat in the head, with this large, well, I think you know what it is. But the queue of the ride is also great, making you feel as if you entered the pages of the book. However, the ride itself is now like Gloucester suffering from low maintenance. Another great area is Mac Elligott's pool, so overall Sus Landing breaks away from standard theme park norm, providing no straight lines, and so making you feel as if you entered this strange world. The next island is the Lost Continent. Originally this was a massive land, but it has slowly been shrinking and currently has no attractions. The main event for this land is Mythos, the park's main restaurant, designed by Jordan Moser, who also worked on some cheesecake factories. His style is out of this world, combining different elements from different cultures. The restaurant poetically creates a landscape in its interior, with the pools and the caverns that give the place a sense of exploration. The decor combines elements from Roman and Greek mythology, with forms inspired by Salvador Dali and Jean Cocteau at least according to the architects themselves. This restaurant is often overlooked, but it does have some very cool details, with a dragon and his mouth as a pizza oven. The exterior is also great, featuring a city emerging from stone, with mythological faces. Outside used to be Poseidon's Fury, a massive and impressive show like no other. Unfortunately, it closed forever. But the exterior is still visible, it showcases Poseidon's trident, and a hand indicating this massive colossus-like statue used to be here, at least in story. There is also a small store. The other part of Lost Continent showcases more Arabian influences, with a proper street market. This area has a great ambience to it. There is also a talking fountain, which is always a fun way to get wet. The fountain used to mark the entrance to another defunct experience, Sinbad, Eighth Voyage. The show dared to ask the question, what if there was another Sinbad adventure, and apparently nobody cared so it closed. Perhaps the reason most guests visit Islands of Adventure is for the Wizarding World. This land changed the theme park industry forever. To this day, this land surprises millions of guests. But why? When you first enter this land, you are greeted by a large portal. After this, you get this fantastic perspective, with Hogsmeade close to you and a castle far off. This creates an inviting look and a sense of exploration. You feel like you are smaller, as if you are part of something larger. These shops are also much detailed, you can check out the signs and the fun easter eggs. The interiors are a bit small, creating a small town feel. The architecture creates a crooked, unrealistic building giving a sense of mystery and intrigue, as if this place is truly magical. The buildings look like they are collapsing, so while some theme park fans might disregard the wizarding world because it's too popular, it is filled with a lot of details and important elements that changed the theme park industry forever. Universal also made a genius decision to connect this land with Diagon Alley at the other park with the Hogwarts Express, incentivizing guests to purchase a park-to-park -park ticket. This dynamic strategy allows for both parks to have great attendance. But this land didn't open with the park, it used to be Merlin Woods, part of the Lost Continent. In fact, the Tree Broomsticks restaurant is the same facility as a magical tree. A later addition is Hagrid's Magical Critters Motorbike Adventure. This coaster is simply great. First off is the Church Ruins, that immerse guests into this landscaping. This thrilling coaster combines emotion and immersive storytelling. It is a worthy replacement to Dueling Dragons. Hogwarts Castle features the park's main e-ticket ride, that utilizes the Kuka Arm system, bringing magic and invention together. 
the park's original main island was Jurassic Park. Here guests travel to the fictional Isla Nublar. This is a bigger version of the Hollywood version in California. This land features the boat ride and the Discovery Center, and also Pizza Predatoria, with a very nice sign. But the most recent addition was Velocicoaster. Located at a small site that used to be the Triceratops encounter, this roller coaster winds itself through the land. The coaster takes advantage of the site. It can be divided in two parts. First is the Raptor Pack area, where guests outside can see the coaster cars going by. The coaster passes through rock works and foliage along with some raptor statues. The other part is located near the lake, providing close encounters with the water and the paths. The small problem is that the coaster is themed to Jurassic World in a Jurassic Park land, creating a weird juxtaposition. A small hidden area is Camp Jurassic, which is basically an immersive playground. It creates a diverse landscaping with caverns and waterfalls. However, a weird land is Coal Island. This site was originally envisioned as a Jurassic Park Jeep ride, but now it is themed to the Universal Pictures King Kong movie. This ride utilizes a ride system similar to Fast and Furious Supercharged, but recently it lost 3D and the outside elements making the ride feel less immersive and less worth it. This is a weird land because it just has this ride, as compared to the other islands in the park. The next island is Toon Lagoon. This, alongside with Sus Landing, makes you feel like you entered the cartoon world. Toon Lagoon is the wettest island of all. Dudley Do Right Falls is based on the J-Ward cartoon, and features an interesting design with the mountains in the back with one of the characters having a dynamite on his mouth and a sawmill. It also features an airtime hill after the first drop, creating an interesting twist on the classic log flume formula. Another great area is themed to Popeye. The ride in itself can get you quite wet, but notice the nice cartoony rock work. You can go over the Me Ship Olive. Not only is it fun, but you get this incredible view of the lake. This area is quite nice, offering great views of Velocity Coaster and some detailed props. The reason this space feels empty is because there used to be a ride here, the Island Skipper Tours. Batum Lagoon also has its own street, or should I say, comic strip. This area plays homage to classic comic strips with the architecture of the buildings. Each facade has its own unique, should I say, character. Unfortunately, the area has suffered with one of the stores being turned into a Universal Orlando Annual Pass lounge. Many call this land outdated, but I would argue it's evergreen. Comic strips have been part of our lives for generations. It is an art that we are slowly losing, but I think it has potential. Speaking of that, there is the unused Toon Lagoon Theater. Most of the time it sits empty, utilized during special events and other boring stuff, as so it is precious real estate for future expansion. While Universal originally wanted DC Comics, they eventually ended up with Marvel, before Disney bought Marvel. This land takes its inspiration from the comics themselves. Each building is full of color, and you can see massive character arts throughout the land, from your favorite superheroes. There is even a building that changes color depending on your perspective. The main event here is the world class The Adventures of Spider-Man. This ride is mind-blowing combining practical and 3D effects, as this ride immerses you into the world of the comics. Guests ride a scoop vehicle in the most dangerous night in New York, encountering some classic super villains. The land's other attraction is a B&M lunch coaster. While the coaster doesn't feature much theming, it is quite imposing in the landscaping of the park, creating a nice skyline. But Islands of Adventure continues to evolve, as the park approaches its next decade, we can expect new adventures to come by. From its humble beginnings to global acclaim, the journey of Islands of Adventure is a testament to the power of vision, perseverance and the relentless pursuit of excellence. One thing becomes abundantly clear when you look at this park. Greatness is not achieved overnight. It is the result of countless hours of dedication, creativity and Passion. Here is to the timeless enchantment of Universal's best theme park. But don't fret, my friends, as the adventure lives on.